Hey, how's it going guys? This is a 2003 BMW 5 Series and it's been sitting in a garage for 3 years. As you can see, the entire car is covered in a thick layer of dust. And there are spiders living behind the steering wheel. At a glance, the car looks like... Well, it's in decent condition. So why is this car sitting? I found this car on a used car website for just $1150. That sounds like an absolute bargain for a car that was originally sold for $100,000. Today, 20 years later, the average asking price of one of these cars is around $5,000. But the owner is only asking $1150. Looking at the description says the car has a blown head gasket and a flat battery. Finding a car like this raises questions for many people. Like, how expensive it is to fix a car like this? Where can you buy the parts from? Are these DIY cars? So if you have any of these questions, then this video is for you because I'm on my way to buy this car and that is where you guys join the journey. And there is the car. Wow, headlights are all faded. That's an easy fix. Front window is open. That could be a bad window regulator. The condition of the body panels looks really good. Good reflections on the paint. Everything looks original. Good beige leather interior. Wow, that's a classic BMW interior. Alright, that's enough looking. It is time to meet the owner. Alright, I spoke with the owner and he was happy to negotiate and I just bought the car for $725. Now that's what I call a bargain. I called in a tow truck and he's here already. So it is time to take this car home. After a long drive, the car is home. Taking a walk around the car, the front bumper is hit right on the parking sensors. Got brand new tires. Looking at the interior, there are no scratches on the wood panels. No faded letters on the buttons. Everything seems to be in original condition. The only thing I see broken in this interior is this air vent, which is very easy to replace. Speaking of replacing, if you look under the hood, the oil filter, the air filter, cabin air filters, they are all easy to get to. There's your alternator. There's your ignition coils and spark plugs. There's your fuel injectors. Everything is easy to get to. So regular maintenance in this car is something anyone can do at home. Just to show you that this is definitely a DIY friendly car. And now I'm gonna connect the car to a car battery so we can check the car's electronics. Okay, the wipers work. So let's try the key. And the car is back to life. The display is good, no dead pixels. We have 196,000 kilometers. That's about 120,000 miles. Lights work. 10 signals. They work. Got some dead pixels on the radio. Jeez, people would love a photo with a koala. but everything else works. The fan works, electric steering column. That works, electric windows. That works, that works, that works. Okay, that doesn't work. So need a new window regulator there, electric mirrors. They work. Interior lights. They work. Sunroof works. Electric memory seats. That works. Electric passenger seat. Okay, that doesn't work. You can see the seat is twisting, but that's an easy fix. And the only other thing I found broken in the car is the adjuster for the headlight level. But that's an easy fix as well. So let's plug in a scan tool to the car and see if the computers have any issues.
All right, the scan is done and we have a few issues. The instrument cluster has four issues. Tank sensitive is faulty, that is the sensor for the fuel gauge. Terminal 15 voltage supply, that is the ignition switch. EGS signal line disturbed, that is the transmission computer. And the last one is the ABS computer. Well, this one is easy. When you turn on the ignition to start the car, the instrument cluster is communicating with the fuel sensor to know the fuel level and with the computers to do a safety check. But when you have a dead battery or one that is getting weak, the instrument cluster can't communicate with any of these sensors and computers, so that's why you have these errors. Next, we have an airbag fault. Same reason again. Parking sensors have two codes. We have two bad transducers. Those are the damaged parking sensors on the front bumper. The radio has one code. Transport mode active. That means all the active systems like the remote key has been turned off to save the battery. The body control module has six codes. Not enough voltage for the electric motors. And finally the immobilizer. Well, the same reason again. So there's nothing wrong with the car's computers. This guy just needs a new battery. So let's get to it. When replacing a car battery, you remove the negative terminal first. And then on the new battery, you install the negative terminal last. So you won't short out the positive terminal on the car's chassis. And the battery is done. Alright, the next thing you want to check before you start the car is the coolant. And it is completely empty. And we have coolant residue everywhere. Now that tells you there's been a leak. So all you can do for now is just add new coolant. Moving on to the engine oil. The oil level is full. And there is no sign of coolant in oil. That is interesting. Now, there are a few more things you have to check before you start a car like this that's been sitting, like checking for stuck piston rings, and I have done all that, but I'll show them in the next video because now it's time to start this car for the first time after three years. Alright, things are looking good. No startup rattles, there's no engine knocking. No coolant leaks so far. No white or blue smoke coming out of the tailpipe. But I can certainly hear a small misfire. You guys hear that? That is a misfire. But everything else is looking good. So let's go for a test drive. Okay, the power steering is very smooth. No binding. Now when you test drive a car like this, you want to get the car up to a decent speed to make sure the transmission is going through all the gears without slipping. Well, I can feel the gear changes are very smooth and so is the ride. Now this is why you buy a BMW 5 Series. The ride is really good, nice and stable. The brakes feel strong, doesn't pull to a side, no vibrations in the steering wheel and even after a decent drive, the car is not overheating either. So not bad at all for $725. So let's go home and check on the head gasket. Okay, that's the coolant leak I was talking about. There's a tiny crack on the coolant tank and if you listen, you can hear the coolant is boiling. That's because when there's a leak, the cooling system can't hold the pressure so the boiling point of the coolant drops below the operating temperature of the engine so the coolant starts to boil. So this is normal but the problem is a bad head gasket can also do this so before you can check the head gasket, you need to fix the leak. So let's get to it. First you remove the bleeder screw. Then remove all the hoses attached to the tank. Unplug the coolant level sensor. Remove the old tank. Install the new tank. Connect everything back together. Reinstall the bleeder screw. And the tank is done. Alright, now we need a radiator pressure tester kit like this to see if the system is holding pressure. So first you add in some coolant. 
then attach the tester to the tank pump the system up to about 15 psi like that and then check for leaks and look what i just found the water pump is leaking too so you need a new water pump as well and you start with removing the fan for this you need a fan clutch wrench set like this you use one wrench to loosen the fan while using the other to hold the fan pulley and then move the fan out of the way now remove all the hoses attached to the fan shroud so you can remove the fan shroud now while i have easy access i'm gonna replace the thermostat as well so remove the lower and upper radiator hoses from the thermostat remove the bolts that hold the thermostat in place unplug the electrical connection then with a little pull the thermostat comes right out to remove the water pump first you loosen the water pump pulley remove the dust cap on the tensioner pulley release the tension on the serpentine belt like that move the pulley out of the way then remove the nuts on the water pump thread two bolts from the thermostat into the extraction holes on the water pump housing like that and the water pump comes right out that noise is the bad bearing seal so this water pump is definitely bad after cleaning the old gasket material off the mounting surface and lubricating the o-ring with silicon paste you can slide in the new water pump and then torque it down to 10 newton meters now before you install the new thermostat it is best to use some gasket maker on the mounting surface for a better seal and then tighten the bolts to 10 newton meters then put the water pump pulley back on put the belt back on plug the electrical connection back on reinstall the upper and lower radiator hoses put the tension and pulley dust cap back on put the fan shroud back on reattach the coolant hoses to the fan shroud reinstall the fan attach the coolant tank back on the fan shroud and you are ready to refill the cooling system so first you remove the two bleeder screws then you start adding coolant into the tank when the coolant start coming out of each bleeder hole you put the screws back on and then with the fan on and the heater on the max heat you start the engine and leave it running at operating temperature for about five minutes after that you shut off the engine wait for it to cool down and then you can top up the tank to the correct level and you are done and now you can properly check the head gasket now for those who are new to fixing cars the engine of a car is a two-piece design on the bottom half you have the engine block also known as the crankcase which houses the combustion chambers and the pistons and on the top half you have the engine head which houses the intake and exhaust valves and the purpose of the head gasket is to seal the engine head to the engine block so it has to seal the combustion chambers as well as the oil and coolant passages that run between the head and the block so when you have a failure in the head gasket the symptoms you see varies depending on where it fails so if the failure is between oil and coolant passages then you can have oil in the coolant or coolant in the oil that looks like a milkshake like this but we already checked the oil and the coolant and as you can tell they are clean all right if the failure is between a coolant passage and outside or between an oil passage and outside or between a combustion chamber and outside then you're gonna have oil leaks or coolant leaks or carbon deposits on the engine block near the head gasket so i'm gonna use a boroscope camera to check the block all the way around and as you can tell we don't seem to have any leaks on the block either all right if the failure is between a combustion chamber and a coolant passage then you have combustion gases leaking into the cooling system so to check that you need a combustion gas leak tester kit like this the kit comes with a test tube and a bottle of testing liquid you set up the test tube on the coolant tank add testing liquid to the tube then start the engine and get it to the operating temperature and then you squeeze the bulb to suck air through the liquid 
this liquid can change its color from blue to yellow when exposed to combustion gases, like this. But as you can tell, there's no difference in color, so there's no failure between the combustion chambers and the coolant passages either. So the coolant overflowing you saw earlier is just coolant vapors expanding from the boiling because the system couldn't hold the pressure because of the two leaks we had in the system. Alright, if the failure is between a combustion chamber and an oil passage, then you have a rise in pressure in the crankcase and the last failure you can have is between two nearby combustion chambers. This allows the combustion gases to pass in between the chambers so you can have engine misfiring with no trouble codes and this engine is misfiring. So to check these two possibilities, you have to do a compression test using a compression tester and a cylinder leak down tester. You start with removing all the ignition coils and all the spark plugs. Then remove the fuse for the fuel pump, which is fuse 22, so you don't have any fuel coming into the engine as you crank. Now this engine has 10.2 to 1 compression ratio. Multiply that by atmospheric pressure. The minimum reading you should see is 149 psi. So thread the compression gauge into the spark plug hole and then crank the engine six times to see the reading. Cylinder number one. Hundred and ninety-five psi. Wow that is really good. Cylinder number two. Hundred and ninety psi. Cylinder number 3 190 psi again Cylinder number 4 190 psi Cylinder number 5 195 psi Cylinder number 6 195 psi now that is very good very consistent compression readings on all six cylinders moving on to the leak down test first you zero out the tester and then using a screwdriver and a breaker bar get each piston to the top dead center in the compression cycle like that and then attach the tester to the spark plug hole to see the reading cylinder number one no leak Cylinder number two, no leak. Cylinder number three, there's no leak. Cylinder number four, there's no leak. Cylinder number five, no leak. Cylinder number six, there's no leak. And that is 100% confirmed that this guy does not have bad head gasket. And boy, do I feel good. So there you go, that is unbelievable. So it seems someone misdiagnosed this car, but now the question is why is this car misfiring? Alright, let's start with the basics using a cheap scan tool that you can use with your phone. Alright, for an engine to fire properly, the air to fuel ratio should be 14.7 to 1. So your engine has a mass airflow sensor to measure the airflow going into the engine and an oxygen sensor to measure the air that's been used for the combustion. This car has two oxygen sensors. One for the bank 1, the first three cylinders, and one for the bank 2, the last three cylinders. So using these three sensors, the computer can control the fuel delivery at the injectors at the correct ratio. This is called the short term fuel trim. So if you select that, you can see the computer is adding 27% more fuel to keep the engine running. So either you have more air coming in through a vacuum leak, so the computer is trying to compensate that by adding more fuel, or you have a bad sensor giving wrong information to the computer. So let's check the sensors first. Alright, a good oxygen sensor should read between 0.1 volts and 0.9 volts when operating. So we have that. And as a rule of thumb, 
a good mass airflow sensor should read close to 2 grams of air per second per 1 liter of engine displacement at 1000 rpm. So this 3 liter engine should have close to 6 grams of air at 1000 rpm. So we have that and then close to 12 grams at 2000 rpm. We have that and then close to 18 grams at 3000 rpm. We have that. So the response is good within the entire rev range as well. So the sensors are fine. But notice when the revs go up, the fuel trims come down. Now that is a classic vacuum leak sign. When more air is coming through the mass airflow sensor, the air coming through the leak become less noticeable so there's no need to add more fuel. So this car definitely has a vacuum leak. So to find the leak, I'm going to use a smoke machine, but most people don't have these machines, so to do this at home, first you want to get an empty paint can like this with the lid. I'm using a jar that is heat proof, just so I can demonstrate this better. And then drill two holes on the lid. Install two barb fittings. Attach some tube into the fittings. Fill the jar with wood chips and charcoal. Light a fire to create smoke. And then as you blow into one tube, the smoke comes out of the other. And there's your very own smoke machine. Alright, after removing the mass airflow sensor, you can blow smoke into the intake boot. And right away, we have smoke coming out of the intake boot. So that is one leak. And it is also coming from underneath the intake manifold as well. It's kind of hard to see where the smoke is actually coming from. So you have to remove the upper intake boot. And then this little valve called the diesel valve. And then the lower intake boot. Move the dipstick out of the way. So now you have enough room to look around. And look what I just found. The oil return line on the crankcase ventilation valve is broken. Look at that. This hose is 20 years old and you can see the rubber is sort of starting to melt. So guess what? It is time for a new ventilation valve with all new hoses. And you start off by removing the dipstick. Then unplug all the electrical connections. Undo the bolts on the wiring box. Move that out of the way. Remove the idle air control valve. Remove the throttle body. And now you have access to the crankcase ventilation valve and the broken oil return line. Alright. First, you want to disconnect all the hoses connected to the valve. Now these hoses have push locks. So you pinch the tabs like that and pull. Alright, now you loosen the crankcase ventilation valve, remove the lower hose, get that out of the way. The upper hose has a twist lock, so you turn the hose 90 degrees counterclockwise and pull and the crankcase ventilation valve is out. Now remove the old upper hose, install the new upper hose, Slide the new ventilation valve into place. Match up and turn the upper hose 90 degrees clockwise to lock it in place. Then put the screws back in. Slide the new lower hose in. Snap it in place. Remove the blind plug from the old valve. Install it on the new valve. Install the new oil return line. And you are ready to put everything back together. Alright, the throttle body is dirty. So with a little cleaning. And with the new gasket, you can put it back on and then tighten the bolts to 10 Newton meters. Now put the idle air control valve back on, move the wiring box back into place and plug all the connectors back in. Alright, 
Now remove the broken oil retain line from the dipstick. Connect the new oil retain line to the dipstick. Put the dipstick back in. Reinstall the lower intake boot. Put the diesel valve back in. Install the new upper intake boot. Put the mass airflow sensor back on. Put the airbox back together. Replace the remaining hose on the intake manifold so you can snap all the hoses back into place. Now the purpose of the crankcase ventilation valve is releasing the excess pressure inside the engine into the intake manifold while retaining any oil vapors back into the engine. And since it is connected directly to the valve cover, any leak on the valve cover like this may still cause a vacuum leak. So to fix the leak properly, you need a new valve cover gasket as well. Alright, so first you remove the cabin air filter. Then remove the ground wire, unplug all the ignition coils and then move the wiring harness out of the way. Then remove the ignition coils and loosen the bolts that hold the valve cover in place. And then with a little pull, the valve cover is out. Now this gasket is so old that it just crumbles. So remove the old gasket and install the new gasket. Now these valve covers tend to leak oil at the front where the head and the timing cover meet, right here. So using a dab of gasket maker on the front gives you a better seal. After cleaning the mating surface with some degreaser. Put the valve cover back on and then torque it down to 10 newton meters from middle out. And you are done. Now let's see what we have. Well, the fuel trims are back to normal and the misfire is gone. Here is the before. And this is how the car sounds now. Purring like a kitten. So now I can start restoring the car. And that brings us on to the most important question. Where to get the parts from and how much do they cost? Well, I only use OEM or genuine parts and I buy them from online stores. So the new valve cover gasket, $33. Crankcase ventilation valve, $114. Coolant tank, $40. Thermostat, $60. Intake boot, $22. And the water pump, $47. Now I'm gonna replace a few more things in the car as preventive maintenance. So a new radiator, $160. New radiator hoses including genuine coolant, $240. The oil pan gasket is leaking, new gasket, $12. Power steering lines are leaking, new lines with the reservoir, $74. Transmission oil cooler lines are starting to leak, new lines, $165. Tie rod dents have play on both sides. New rods, including new boots, $88. Moving on to the cosmetic repairs, the windshield cowl is cracking, new cowl, $88. The windshield molding is disintegrating, new molding, $28. New regulator for the front window, $146. The door seal on the driver's side is cracking, new door seal, $112. Seat base covers are damaged, new covers, $98. A new air vent for the dashboard is $160, but I found a used one from the junkyard for $30. New level adjusters for the headlights, $9. Two new moldings for the headlights, $20. And finally, there's filters and oil, which I'm not gonna price out because that is something all cars need. So even with a few extra parts I ordered for future repairs, the total for me including the difference in exchange rates and shipping is $1,949. At $725 purchase price of the car and $150 for the towing, 
The total cost of buying and properly restoring this car back to its original condition is only $2,824. The market value for the car is around $5,000, so that's more than $2,000 in profit if I want to sell the car to a buyer. Goes to show you that if you work on your own car, then you can drive any car you want. And I'll be restoring this car in a series of upcoming videos. As always, if you like the video, press that like button, leave a comment down below, let me know what you guys think. All the tools I used in the video as well as the links to my cool new mesh are down in the description, so go check them out. We have cool stuff for everyone. And if you want to see more DIY videos just like this one, subscribe to the Junkie DIY Guy channel and I'll see you in the next one.